So I think at this point, it's pretty safe to say that Sean O'Malley will be fighting Marab de Valishalis next. And, you know, for a long time, I held the belief that Marab was a bit overrated. But I think at this point, I'm going to rescind that statement. Not because I view him as a fighter any differently, just that I think by now people honestly just rate him a lot more properly than they did in the past. But still, even with that being said, a lot of people are still viewing him as a very, very difficult matchup for Sean O'Malley. Some people would even use the term nightmare matchup. But to me at least, Sean O'Malley's fight with Aljamain Sterling was all it took to prove that he should not be the underdog against Marab. In fact, I think he should be the favorite. But before we get into that, I do want to address something. In my last video, I did a bit of a recap for UFC 299, and I had made a point that I think Cheeto Vera exposed a weakness in Sean O'Malley's game. And that weakness was, while Sean O'Malley is fighting on the outside... He is the best in the entire division. There is not one bantamweight alive that fights as well as he does at range. But when you blitz him, when you get into the pocket, he gets uncomfortable. And the tendency that I noticed a lot in that Cheeto fight was that he would shell up and leave his body open. And this all culminated into Cheeto landing a liver shot with two seconds left to go that actually really hurt Sean. And I said a high-level striker at 135 could definitely exploit this. But I would say a fair amount of people had some pushback against this. And I think the primary argument that they were bringing up was well, the only reason Cheeto landed that liver shot was because O'Malley just unloaded with five seconds left trying to finish him. He put himself in danger, and that was the only reason why Cheeto was in that position to land that punch. And first off, that's not true. And second off, it's kind of beside the point. The point wasn't that Cheeto Vera all of a sudden now has Sean O'Malley's number with that body shot, and that in a hypothetical rematch, he folds him with a liver shot. Because Cheeto is simply levels below Sean O'Malley. I mean, Sean's way faster, and he has a way higher technical efficiency when it comes to kickboxing. I mean, it is just that simple. Closing the distance with Sean O'Malley is no easy task. And that's because of how good his movement is, but also how he throws feints. And that is why in the first few rounds, Cheeto really struggled to get into the pocket. But he did eventually get there, starting in the second half of the third round. He closes the distance, and Sean gets uncomfortable. He shells up, and he leaves his body open. You can see it in all of these examples. And here's Cheeto actually landing that body shot before the final sequence. Now, he wasn't able to hurt him here, but he still landed the body shot. And then you go back and you look at the Peter Yan fight, who is the kind of guy I'm talking about when I say that this tendency from Sean to be uncomfortable in the pocket worries me. Because there were multiple moments where Peter was able to close the distance and Sean did the exact same thing. But obviously you can tell Peter's game plan was to grapple and to wrestle. So when Sean would shell up, he would shoot. But in a five-round fight, if I was his team, I would be looking to rip the body when you get on the inside. You do not want to fight on the outside with Sean O'Malley. No one in the division can do it except for maybe Corey Sanhagen. I recall one person commenting, oh, Sean's weakness is having a liver? Uh, well, newsflash, Cheeto has one too, which, funny, very, very funny. But the thing is there, Cheeto protects his liver a lot better when he shells up. But overall, I just wanted to address all this because, honestly, I don't think I presented my argument as good as I could have in the last video, so it's 100% on me. And at the end of the day, we're not going to have to worry about this for a while because, like I said at the beginning of the video, Sean's next fight is most likely going to be against Marab. And he poses a very different threat than attacking your body, that is for sure. The thing about Marab is, he lactates EPO. I'm telling you guys, you can get some fucking sustenance from this guy's nipples. I mean, it, it would take no exaggeration, less than five minutes of nursing on Marab's tit for you to be able to run the Badwater race as fast as David Goggins. By no means do I want to downplay Marab's skills. You know, he's a really good wrestler. And clearly, he will never have a problem going five rounds. It does not matter what kind of pace you put on Marab, he's going to hang in there with you. I mean, obviously... But I've always been of the mind that some of his best performances are a bit... Well, how could I put this? 
very dependent on his opponent's style. Well, let me talk about his last few fights and see if you guys notice any patterns here. Oh, first one, Jose Aldo. Against Jose Aldo, Marab had no issues shooting. I mean, he shot a lot of takedowns. He didn't get any of them. He did not complete one successful takedown against Jose Aldo. But the main thing was he was able to shoot and he was able to hold Aldo up against the fence. And Jose Aldo is known for using a Muay Thai stance in a lot of his fights. I mean, he certainly used one against Marab, which means he's very stationary, but with tight defense and a light front leg. Then we go to Peter Yan. Now, he also has a very stationary style. He uses a lot of boxing, and he always keeps a very high guard. And Marab was able to shoot a lot on him. Now, he was able to complete takedowns, though Yan never got held down. Marab just never stopped shooting. So, Yan pretty much got completely muted. Could not get any offense going at all. And he got 50-45 to be pretty much destroyed. And then Marab fights Henry Cejudo. Now, Cejudo fights with a bit of a karate style. And he utilizes a ton of movement. And in the first round of their fight, Marab only completed one successful takedown as he picked up the single leg as Henry was moving in. But other than that, Cejudo was able to win the round using his movement to constantly circle, never be a stationary target, and keep himself at distance. And he was even able to catch Marab coming in with a clean left hook. But very early in the second round, Henry Cejudo began to gas. Which is interesting because the pace wasn't super high in that first round. It wasn't slow by any means, but you look back at Cejudo's fights with Demetrius Johnson, and it was just scrambles for days, all five rounds. And the big thing was Cejudo stopped moving. Marab would move in, closing the distance, and instead of circling away, Cejudo started swinging in the pocket. And then the takedown started coming from Marab, and then he absolutely ragdolled Henry. But don't just take my word for it. Cejudo's corner felt the exact same way. So our truck picked up the pseudo corner to tell him in Spanish that they feel like his movement is giving Dwalis Willie problems. So I really think that is a huge variable when it comes to matching up against Marab. He constantly wants to be shooting on you. He constantly wants to smother you. When you look at Marab's record, he has won almost all of his fights by decision. He has one KO against Marlon Marais, and that was because Marais rocked him really badly. Marab was out on his feet, and Marlon unloaded everything he had trying to finish the fight, gassed out, and Marab knocked him out with ground and pound. But other than that, Marab does not have a ton of ways to finish the fight. He's not super high level with submissions. He's not a knockout artist by any means. He is dependent on shooting a lot and overwhelming you and fatiguing you. And uh, look, don't get me wrong. Clearly, he is really, really, really good at implementing this strategy. But if you're going to be a target standing right in front of him, then you're really playing into his game. And, of course, you look at Sean O'Malley's fight with Aljamain Sterling, and a criticism a lot of people had about that fight was, Aljo just didn't shoot in, like, round one. I, he, I'm pretty sure he, like, would have crushed Sean, but he just decided not to shoot for some reason. I, I don't know why. He just, he chose not to, clearly. No, that, that's not true. It requires a lot of timing to get deep in on a takedown. It's not as simple as just shooting from halfway across the octagon like Habib did against Connor. Like, typically, th that's not supposed to work. Evident by how difficult it was for Habib to finish that takedown. When you go back and rewatch that fight between Sean O'Malley and Aljamain Sterling, the entire first round is Aljo trying to pressure Sean back up against the fence, but Sean's movement and his fainting make it so hard to do. But it's also the fact that Sean is fighting so long. He's throwing a lot of teeps. And in a moment where Aljo did try to pressure forward, Sean popped his head back with a jab and then circled out. When Aljo finally did have a takedown attempt at the end of the round, he tried to shoot the double leg. But because Sean was in the process of circling out, he had to switch to the single, which is going to be way harder to finish, especially up against the fence. And then the next time he was able to shoot was because Sean slipped while throwing a teep. So clearly, pinning Sean O'Malley down is not going to be an easy task for Marab. He needs to set up his takedowns with something. Now, typically, wrestlers like doing this with strikes. And Marab is a fan of this strategy as well. He did this against Peter Yan. As you guys know, Peter Yan keeps up a high guard. He likes to catch punches on his hands and counter. 
Though, as you all know by now, this just allowed Marab to never stop shooting, because he was able to get really deep every time he shot. But when you look at how Marab enters into range, a lot of times it's a little sloppy. Like, look when Cejudo landed this hook on him. He kinda just walked into range. Imagine him fighting Sean O'Malley, a guy who's gonna have a huge height and reach advantage. And I'll tell you from experience, from watching his fight with Aljamain Sterling, Sean O'Malley is not going to overextend at all. He didn't throw a meaningful punch until Aljamain Sterling literally ran at him face first. And that's because if he were to whiff on a right hand, Aljo ducks underneath, gets a hold of his legs. I mean, he was in serious trouble. I mean, it's going to be very similar here. Sean's going to be waiting on the outside. He's going to be throwing a lot of teeps, constantly moving, constantly circling, just waiting for Marab to have to be the one who walks into range, and he's going to be looking to snipe him. But uh, by no means do I think this is a 100% easy win for Sean O'Malley. If he cannot finish Marab, and we start getting into the third, fourth, fifth round, I mean, Marab will definitely have the ability to take over, but can he actually finish the fight with his takedowns? Evident by his record that we looked at earlier, probably not. And if the examples we looked at earlier in Sean's fight with Cheeto are going to tell us anything, it's that Sean begins to slow down a bit halfway through the third round. So perhaps it's possible Marab really starts picking up the pace. He's able to squeak out a decision, but just when you look at Sean's movement, how good he is at feinting, how good he is at keeping guys on the end of his shots, and how spotty Marab's striking defense really is, I don't think there's any way you can make Marab the favorite in this matchup. I just don't. 